Hey everybody, my name is Marina and I'll be talking about adaptive massively parallel constant round tree contraction. So tree contraction is a general process for solving a large number of problems on trees. So given a problem P and a tree T, the idea is basically to find a process to iteratively contract components of T um, until T becomes a single vertex. This contraction process must have, must have two different properties. The first property is the contraction must be efficient and reversible. So efficiency is obviously important. Um, reversibility is also important for uh, solutions that require um, construction on the entire tree. So once you um, find the, the solution on the single vertex after contraction, we still have to reverse the process to figure out how it looks on the entire tree. In addition, um, as we do this contraction process, when we contract a component, we're going to be labeling the new vertex that it was contracted into with data um, that kind of describes something important about the original tree we just compressed. That data, of course, must be space efficient so that we can keep it um, stored efficiently in parallel. And it also must be sufficient to uh, reconstruct the, the solution to the original problem on the original tree. So this just basically means we don't want to lose too much information to be able to solve the initial problem as we contract. Um, so this method was first introduced by Miller and Reif in 1985. They found a PRAM algorithm where PRAM is parallel random access memory. Um, it's a model of distributed computation. That's kind of probably what you imagine when you think of parallel computation. It's just a bunch of like processors that can do individual um, computations in parallel. So this algorithm that was in PRAM uh, requires O of log n depth, um, which is basically a measurement of time. We call it rounds here because we're going to um, we're going to relate it to a round complexity in another another model of computation. Now, while we note that these complexities aren't directly um, analogous, uh, the reason we compare them is because they are both measurements of communication. So the number of PRAM rounds is effectively how many times um, processors need to communicate. So in this algorithm, they need to communicate O of log n time. And our goal is going to be to reduce that amount of communication in a different model. So this PRAM algorithm has been improved upon multiple times, but they all still require O of log n rounds. Um, the algorithm has also been extended to a number of different applications, including circuit evaluation, finding planar graph separators, approximating tree width, and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's talk about how the algorithm itself works. We're going to be using the example of expression evaluation, where you're given a mathematical expression you'd like to evaluate, and specifically the expression in the top right. So if we want to solve this using tree contractions, we first have to represent it as a tree. So the way we do this is we put all the values at the leaves, and then we construct the tree going up based off of the order of operations. So you put the operators according to which you would apply first. Um, and in order to solve this tree, we apply uh, tree contractions. So tree contractions run in a number of phases, um, and each phase consists of two stages. Uh, so the first stage is going to be compress. In compress, what the original algorithm does is it contracts every other vertex with exactly one child into its parent. So we have this notion of a chain. A chain is a stick within a tree, a, a long chain of parents with one child, with one child, with one child, and so on. And as we can see in our tree, we have a quite long chain. And what we do is we take every other vertex on this chain and contract it into its parent. So when we do this, we obviously get rid of some vertices, but we don't want to lose the information from those vertices. So when we contract two vertices, what we're going to do is we're going to store on that vertex the new function that is the composition of those two functions. So for instance, when we contract the negation into the inverse operator, we get this new function g of x, which is negative x to the negative first. Similarly, when we contract the negation into the division operator, we get f of x, y, which is a, bi a binary function, um, which is negative x over y. So we apply the negation to the first argument. Okay, so that's how compress works. In rake, we simply contract all leaves into their parents, which looks something like this. In this example, uh, rake consists of um, inputting arguments into functions. So we replace 2 plus 3 with 5, and we input 3 into the second argument of f to yield f prime, which is just going to be negative x over 3. It's now a unary operator. 
And we can imagine continuing continuing this process until we complete. Um, and we find our answer for the evaluation of the expression at the end. Um, now this uh, problem doesn't actually require reversibility because we can just find the solution in the final vertex. Um, however, a related problem is sub-expression evaluation, where we want to take all sub-expressions within the expression and find their value. For instance, we would also want to know what 2 plus 3 is and what negative 2 plus 3 is, what the inverse of that is, and so on. Um, in order to do that, we do need to reverse the process so that we can find the value at each node in the tree, because each node in the tree corresponds to each sub-expression. Um, I'm not going to discuss how to do that, but like there's some bookkeeping you can do um, to make sure that this process is reversible. So I just wanted to point that out. OK, uh, one more thing I'd like to talk about with regard to this algorithm is why it takes O of log n phases. So to do this, um, we're going to be talking about two different examples of trees on either extreme. So the first extreme tree is going to be a single stick tree. So you have n vertices that are all in a stick. Um, rake obviously doesn't do much because you can only remove one vertex at a time if we rake the leaves. Compress, however, if we just apply compress over and over again, um, each time we apply compress, every other vertex will be contracted into its parent, thus reducing the size of the tree by half. Thus, we only require O of log n phases to be able to compress the tree into a single vertex. On the other hand, if we have a complete binary tree, rake is very useful because um, about half the vertices are leaves, and if we get rid of all the leaves, we divide the size of the tree by two, and thus it'll only take um, O of log n time to rake. And then if you have any kind of intermediate tree, just imagine uh, having a kind of combined argument of these two things, such that compress and rake together uh, can solve the tree in O of log n phases. And so that's the basic gist of this algorithm. And again, we're going to be trying to improve the communication complexity of this algorithm by looking to another model of computation. And that model specifically is going to be adaptive massively parallel computation. So this is also known as AMPC. It is the su successor model of distributed computation to massively parallel computation, or MPC. Uh, many of you may know this. Um, MPC is a rather popular framework or model for distributed computation. Um, it's received a lot of attention in the past like 10 or so years, um, and it generalizes a lot of popular frameworks like uh, MapReduce and things like that. So it's a very popular model. Adaptive massively parallel computation was uh, introduced just a few years ago, very new. Still a lot is unknown about this. Um, but yeah, for those of you who are familiar with MPC, AMPC is just a slightly stronger version of MPC. Um, it can solve things more efficiently. And uh, it's also highly practical given um, how commodity hardware, hardware works. OK, so in AMPC, we start with the input being stored on a distributed hash table H0. So what is a distributed hash table? Just think of it as a very large data structure that we can store stuff on um, where we can have parallel access to it. So even when we're doing parallel computation where uh, machines aren't allowed to communicate with each other, um, they are allowed to access this dis distributed hash table, um, which is like really the main difference between adaptive massively parallel computation and MPC um, is the access to this uh, in round distributed hash table. Um, and we'll see why this is stronger. OK, so AMPC procedures um, execute in rounds. And in each round, you're allowed to read from the previous distributed hash table and write to the next one. So notice this doesn't mean you can send messages to any other machine in any tricky way because you're, you're all reading from the same thing and writing to a different thing. Um, and so obviously, this proceeds in some number of rounds. And then in the final distributed hash table, we have to output our solution. OK, so comparing this to MPC, you could rewrite this model to uh, be basically what MPC is if you don't allow in round read and write access to distributed hash tables. If you require you first to read, then to do the, the parallel computation, and then to write to the next hash table. If you do it sequentially like that, it becomes MPC. Um, so what power does this, does this give us? Well. Um, oftentimes in distributed computation, what we want to do is um, store a vertex on a machine as well as its entire neighbor, as well as its neighborhood to be able to do like a kind of local search. 
Um, so in MPC, you can you can do that. You sort a vertex on machine, you look at its neighborhood, and then to get the two hop neighborhoods, you need to do a round of communication to look at all your neighbors and get the, the next um, hop of your neighborhood. However, in AMPC, you could actually execute a different kind of search, a depth first search, right? So in AMPC, you take one vertex, you can query its neighbor on this distributed hash table, and then do that the same thing for that vertex. You can query its neighbor and another neighbor and so on. So you can't do that in MPC, but in AMPC, you can implement depth first search, uh, which is a very unique thing that AMPC can do. So that's the kind of difference. Um, uh, AMPC uh, breaks the one versus two cycle conjecture that it can solve connectivity in um, O of one rounds, whereas in MPC you cannot do that. Or it's conjectured that you cannot do that. <clears throat> now let's talk about complexities. So in AMPC we often look at problems on graphs with n vertices and m edges. Obviously in our case we're looking at trees, so we're going to be looking at n edges. Uh, we have three main complexities of interest. Uh, the most important one usually is the round complexity. Uh, it's what, often what we optimize for. Um, generally, we want this to be something like sub-logarithmic for most problems. Um, obviously, the gold standard is going to be constant um, in terms of n. And uh, this is what we actually will end up achieving in our algorithms. Um, so round complexity is what we're mainly focusing on. We also have memory, which is the local space of each machine during the distributed computation. This is going to be O of n to the epsilon for a fixed epsilon between 0 and 1. So epsilon is going to be viewed as more or less a constant, but we do kind of want to optimize for like dependent, any dependency on epsilon. Note that this is strictly sublinear. This is what we consider the low memory regime. Um, so what that means is that if you have a vertex and you want to store its entire neighborhood, uh, you can't actually do that because it might have up to n minus 1 vertices, whereas we only have O of n to the epsilon space, which is smaller than that. So um, that makes this uh, regime of AMPC much more difficult to work with, and you have to find tricky ways to solve this. The final space we consider often is uh, the total space, um, which is basically how much total storage we have going on at a single time. So it doesn't necessarily consider like the entire history of the distributed hash tables, um, but we want to make sure that any distributed hash table we're considering, plus all the space taken up by all of the processors, is that most linear in the problem size. I just view this as more of a sanity check to make sure we're not really blowing up the space complexity um, given some input. Um, but again, round complexity is the one we're usually optimizing for, and the memory is also something that's very important to be aware of. Okay, so this is uh, the complexities of interest. Okay, now let's look at some known uh, low memory AMPC algorithms that we will both use and compare our results to. So the ones we'll be using are as follows. Rooting, orienting, pre-order numbering, and connectivity on forests. These all have been shown to be able to be run in O of 1 over epsilon AMPC rounds, um, whereas by the 1 versus 2 cycle conjecture, um, they take uh, at least O of log n MPC rounds, or at least we believe that to be the case. Um, so obviously, if we want to implement our algorithms efficiently and we're using these functions, uh, we need to implement them in AMPC over MPC. Our results um, include two algorithms. The first is going to be only on trees of bounded degree. That is, the maximum degree in the tree is at most n to the epsilon, where recall that epsilon is our local memory parameter. So uh, we get an O of 1 over epsilon squared round tree contraction algorithm on trees of bounded degree. And on general trees, it becomes O of 1 over epsilon cubed. Um, now, the, the first result is both used as a subroutine in our main result and also can be applied independently to problems. We'll actually show that some problems um, can be solved on unbounded degree trees if we first do a transformation to similar problems on bounded degree trees. Okay, now let's look at our results and compare them to existing AMPC algorithms. So the first two we'll be looking at is maximal matching and maximal independent set. So for both of these, we so, show that they can be solved in O of 1 over epsilon squared rounds using our first algorithm because they can be translated into bound, problems on bounded degree trees. Now, 
we don't actually beat existing algorithms because there exist constant round algorithms that solve both of these problems. However, we think this is a really interesting strategy that may be able to be used to solve other problems using our more efficient algorithm on bounded degree trees. So that's just like a, a quick result for our first algorithm. Our second algorithm is where we get some of the truly novel applications. So first, maximum cardinality matching, uh, we can solve a one plus epsilon approximate maximal matching algorithm in O of log log n AMPC rounds by a previous result from about a year ago. Um, and we can do this using our algorithms in constant rounds and find an optimal solution. Of course, the caveat here is that we can only do this on trees, but nevertheless, it's an entirely novel result. Maximum weighted matching had a similar result, but it was only a two plus epsilon approximation. And we can also improve this to get the same result on trees. Maximum weighted independent set, to our knowledge, has not been explored in AMPC. Um, so we get the first result, which is 1 over epsilon cubed rounds on trees, and this is also optimal. Finally, tree isomorphism is also a problem we do not believe has ex been explored in AMPC, and we get a first constant time um, algorithm. Okay, so this is our results. Uh, now we can get into some of our actual methods. So the first algorithm we'll talk about is the algorithm on bounded degree trees. So requ recall that tree contractions require two stages, compress and rake. So we will start by describing the compress stage. So in the compress stage, what we're going to do is instead of contracting every other vertex in a chain into its parent, we're going to be contracting larger components of a tree um, into a single vertex. And this will allow us to get much more efficient contraction processes. Um, the way we do this is we do it according to what we call a pre-order decomposition. So a pre-order decomposition takes in two parameters, beta and k. k defines how we're going to partition it. So we're partitioning the graph into what we call k groups. These groups have to agree with the pre-order traversal. And by that, I mean the first vertex in the pre-order traversal must be in the first partition. And any subsequent vertex must be in either the same partition as the previous vertex in the pre-order traversal or the next partition, the next group, sorry. Um, additionally, we have this parameter beta, which um, ensures some guarantee about the size of these groups. So specifically for each group, if we sum the degree of all the vertices in the group, we want the, this to be bounded by beta. And as we might see later, um, this is basically to ensure that the size um, of any anything we need to store on this partition as we compress it will not exceed our machine space. So beta is going to basically be controlling the, the local space of our algorithm. Okay. Now let's talk about how compression actually uses this. So to compress, we contract connected components induced by each group. Why can't we contract each group entirely? Well, they might not be entirely connected. So let's look at the example here on the left. It's a tree and we label each vertex with the group it is in. So the first group is actually quite nice because it's entirely connected. So we can contract that vertex or that um, group into a single vertex as we see on the right. However, group two consists of only isolated vertices. So when we do this contraction process, we don't actually reduce this group at all. In fact, we get um, three individual vertices in the resulting graph. Now this might seem like this is something that makes the computation too difficult to perform, but we actually show that this exhibits a number of nice properties that we can leverage to get an efficient algorithm. So what are the properties? The first property, if beta is greater than or equal to the degree of any vertex in the graph, we can find a decomposition such that the number of groups is at most O of n over beta. Um, now note that the beta parameter um, constraint here is just to make sure that the pre-order decomposition is possible. If there exists a vertex whose degree is greater than beta, then it can't exist in any partition, right? Because otherwise we would violate the beta constraint. So that's just what we mean by beta must be greater than or equal to the max degree in the tree. Um, and this just ensures that we have some sort of bound on the number of groups in our decomposition. The other um, 
the other property we have is that after compression, we know there will be at most one internal node per group. And this comes from the fact that we based it off of the pre-order traversal. So if you consider a group and you look at all connected components induced by that group, every single connected component except the last one will contain all of its descendants. That is necessary by the properties of the pre-order traversal. So when that component is contracted, it will be a leaf. Thus, the only non-leaf that can exist after we do this um, for a single group must be the, the last connected component. And that is something that's gonna be really vital to our argument going forward. Okay, so what we have is we know there are k internal nodes after compression and k equals O of n over beta. To rake, what we're going to do is contract all leaves into their parents. Pretty simple. So this is what our entire process looks like. We compress and then we rake. So if we let beta equal n to the epsilon, which again is our local space constraint, um, we can show that, well, if there are k internal nodes and k is at most n over beta, which is n to the one minus epsilon, um, there are only n to the one minus epsilon internal nodes after compression. We remove all the leaves and that's all that's left in the tree. Therefore, the final tree will only have O of one O of n to the one minus epsilon vertices. If we continue repeating this until we can fit it on one machine, this will only take O of one over epsilon phases. Now, each phase actually requires O of one over epsilon rounds because we have to do a pre order traversal. And if we recall, that requires O of one over epsilon phases in AMPC, at least to our current knowledge. Therefore, this algorithm, as it is, requires O of one over epsilon squared rounds and can solve tree contractions on bounded degree trees. So this is a quite nice result. Um, I won't talk about how to reverse it. It's just, a, again, a matter of bookkeeping, basically. Um, but yeah, it allows us to do uh, tree contractions on bounded degree trees and constant rounds, specifically O of 1 over epsilon squared rounds. Okay, now we're going to talk about how to do this on higher degree trees. So the hardest part about handling high degree trees is the high degree vertices. So naturally, the first thing we're going to do when we compress is temporarily get rid of the high degree vertices. Um, specifically, we're going to pick some threshold alpha uh, and any vertex with degree, at least alpha, is going to be removed temporarily. What we get when we do this is a forest of components of small degree. So we can just in parallel on each tree in the forest, we run our previous algorithm, which takes O of one over epsilon squared rounds to contract that tree into a single vertex. Okay, so we've already leveraged our previous algorithm. And after we contract it, them into single vertices, we put back in the high degree vertices and connect them to the appropriate small components. We call this resulting tree a big small tree because it consists of two types of vertices. The first type is a high degree vertex, i.e. a big, big vertex, and the other is a vertex that represents a um, connected component of small degree vertices that was uh, contracted into a single vertex, and this is what we call a small component. So this process can be represented like this. Um, the tree on the left consists of a bunch of small components um, highlighted in red, we contract them into single vertic vertices, ignoring the uh, high degree vertices that we removed, and we get the following tree on the right. So the high degree vertices in the big in the tree on the right um, are going to be the white ones, and the ones that are shaded in red are the small component vertices. Just like before, this exhibits a number of properties that we can leverage to get our results. So the first property actually is quite simple. The first we just we simply observe that no small component is the parent of another. And this is just by the maximality of the connected components we're contracting. If a small component is the parent of another small component, um, then they would have just been contracted into the same component in this second bullet of this process. And this, um, with some uh, more complicated arguments, allows us to show that after compression, at least an alpha over alpha plus four fractions of the vertices are leads. This is a very high fraction. Therefore, when we rake, it's going to be quite nice. Um, I will defer to the paper for more details on this. Okay, so what we've seen is that we can show that at least an alpha over alpha plus four fraction of the vertices are leaves. Therefore, there are only O of N over alpha internal nodes remaining. When we rake, we simply contract, contract all leaves into their parents. Okay, and we get something that looks like this. 
Based off of the same arguments we had before, if we let alpha equal n to the epsilon so that everything works out, um, we can see that the final tree will have O of n to the 1 minus epsilon vertices. Um, and we can repeat this O of 1 over epsilon times until it can fit on a single machine. So this, again, will take O of 1 over epsilon phases just like before. Um, however, at each phase, we have to call our previous algorithm, which took O of 1 over epsilon squared rounds. Therefore, the final algorithm takes O of 1 over epsilon cubed rounds. Okay, so this is going to be our final result. It's a constant round algorithm for tree contraction on general trees. However, there is one thing I've swept under the rug, and that is how rake works. So in the previous algorithm on bounded degree trees, rake was pretty simple, right? We have each vertex will have at most n to the epsilon leaf children. So um, you can store a vertex and all of its leaf children on a single machine and then contract it in one round in parallel. Um, however, in this case, we might have some problems because a vertex might have um, up to n leaves, n leaf children. So we can't store all those on one machine. So raking is not as trivial in this case. So now we'll briefly discuss how to handle this. And we do this with something we call sibling contraction. So say we have a vertex V and have and V has over n to the epsilon children. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take this starting tree that is just V and its uh, leaf children, um, and we're going to expand it into an n to the epsilon -ary tree, specifically a complete n to the epsilon -ary tree. So every vertex is going to have um, n to the epsilon children as long as it can. So the final one might have fewer. And it's going to look something like this. I have represented it as a binary tree, but you can imagine it's n to the epsilon -ary. Okay, specifically the way this tree is mapped into this other tree is that the root is mapped to the root and the leaves are mapped to the leaves. So the only leaves, sorry, the only vertices we're adding are all the internal nodes except for the root. Okay, everything else is like a real vertex in our original graph. And all we're going to do is we're going to just sequentially rake all the leaves at a certain layer in parallel. So since it's n to the epsilon ary, every vertex has at most n to the epsilon children. So we can store a vertex and all of its children on a single machine and rake all the leaves um, at once. Okay, so if we just do this until we get to the root, then we've contracted the entire tree into a single vertex. Um, since the height of this tree is O of 1 over epsilon because it's n to the epsilon ary, um, this will require at most O of 1 over epsilon parallel rake iterations. Um, therefore, this can be done in O of 1 over epsilon rounds, um, which is even faster than the compressed stage. So this does applying this at each rake does not actually um, increase the asymptotic complexity of our algorithm. Now, this seems like a nice, simple way to do this, um, but I will say this doesn't come without a cost. So when we want to prove that a problem can be solved using tree contractions, we would like to only have to show that we can take a connected component and contract it into a single vertex and still label that vertex with enough information to solve the problem on the initial tree without blowing up the space. That is ideally all we would have to show. But now, given this is how we're handling the, the vertices, we also have to show that we can do, handle expanding the tree and creating these dummy vertices that won't mean anything and then contracting them into back into their parent. So this is actually a different thing to show and is, an, is additional work that you have to do um, to show that a problem can be solved using tree contractions. So it is an unfortunate consequence of our methods, um, but at least so far, we don't see a uh, another solution to doing this. That would be an open question. Um, so yeah, this completes our algorithm, and thus we've shown how to do constant round tree contractions uh, in AMPC, and it solves a large range of problems. I obviously don't have time to get into the applications. They are actually quite interesting, and um, sometimes they can be quite involved. It's not trivial to show a problem can be solved using tree contractions. So. Um, yeah, that, that is the presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. I'd like to thank my co-authors and all previous authors of uh, related works, um, as well as, of course, the uh, people organizing this conference. Thank you.